Hello guys and welcome back to yet another meetup of Pioneer Gujarat. Today I have Joe and Matthew with us who are into data engineering. Matthew is CTO at Tenery Data and a data engineer and architect while Joe is CEO and co-founder of Tenery Data and also a data engineer and architect. Uh, moving ahead, I would like to make a small announcement that uh, we are now building up our community on Slack and this is the form which I'll be linking in the comment section in the LinkedIn as well as on YouTube. So we're trying, uh, if you're interested to join our community, please fill this form. And now I would like to welcome Joe and Matthew to the session today. Thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, and thanks to the audience for showing up at such a late hour in <laughs> India. So. Yeah. Um, before I move ahead, I would like both of you to first introduce yourself to our audience. What do you do? Tenry Data does. And what's your YouTube show all about? Sure. Um, you want me to go, Matt? <laughs> uh, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I, I'm Joe. Uh, from Ternary Data. Ternary Data is a data engineering consulting firm based in Salt Lake City, Utah in the United States. So we specialize in helping companies build solid data foundations to then begin doing um, data science and machine learning and production. So I think much of our reason for starting the company is because Matt and I jokingly refer to ourselves as uh, recovering data scientists. And I think much of our um, experience in forming this company is, um, I think, directly influenced by our experience having been data scientists over and over, doing data science stuff, and um, you know, having I would say some success and some failures as a result of not building a solid data foundation. So our goal is to help companies build solid data foundations. The other comment I would make is that I think Joe and I both kind of have this teaching background. So in Joe's case. You've been heavily involved in a lot of meetups just for the last probably 20, 10, 20 years, um, really teaching people things like Python and data. And on my side, I actually have a PhD in math and I taught for a long time. And so this background really influences our consulting model. So we've more and more tried to steer clear of going in, doing heavy duty implementation work. And instead, we, we really like to train clients. We'd like to work hands on with them and make sure that they understand technology and I think we've, in the process, become evangelists for the career of data engineering. And we just, we love doing this kind of stuff because it lets us get this message out there that um, this is a really needed uh, discipline. And also the world needs a lot of training in this area. There's kind of a shortage of data engineers right now. And would you like to throw some light on your show that you do on Monday mornings on YouTube? Yeah. So we have a uh, weekly show called the Monday Morning Data Chat. Um, I guess it'd be the uh, Monday evening data chat for, for people in the audience in India. So, but yeah, so it, it's an unscripted weekly show where uh, Matt and I will talk about um, maybe, you know, it, the topics vary. There, there's nothing really planned. I, I would say a lot of it is informed by the types of messages we get from audience. Um, so if you have questions, let us know. We'd be happy to answer your questions. And like I said, it's unscripted. And I think the, the format is resonating really well with uh, the audience because we provide, I think, a very candid um, kind of no BS take on just the, our thoughts on data right now. So Yeah. And this evolved out of just conversations that Joe and I would have, conversations we'd have with each other, conversations we had with other people, um, articles we'd encounter on LinkedIn. I mean, we'd always be very opinionated about it. And we're like, okay, we might as well get these opinions out there for better or worse sometimes. Yeah. So right now it's on uh, YouTube, but uh, podcast will be coming maybe as soon as next week. So stay tuned for that. But yeah, as Matt said, it basically it was just us. We just figured we, we talk so much about data that we may as well record ourselves because <laughs> might be some pretty interesting that, material. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I have been watching it and it's so good to learn Thanks. from you both both of oh, you. Thanks. Yeah, before moving ahead of data engineering, uh, I would like you to answer this one question. What's data engineering actually? And um, what does a person do 
as a data engineer and how different it is from being a scientist or analyst yeah i can jump in start yeah yeah I'll, i'll start on this one so i'm first going to comment on where data engineering comes from in other and then i'll jump back to what data engineering is today so the current discipline of data engineering as we define it there are actually a lot of different areas that are called data engineering but as we define it comes partially out of data science and partially out of other maybe data and database roles like ETL developer. And so there's this cliche that says that data scientists spend like 75% of their time acquiring, preparing, processing data, doing things like futurizing so they can actually do interesting things with it. And you know, over time it emerged that there was a need for a discipline that was just dedicated to that part of data science to really transforming and preparing data and especially to automating. Um, you can have the best models in the world, but if you can only train them on your laptop and you can't deploy them, you can't automate training, you can't really get them into production, they're, they're not gonna do a whole lot of good for your business. And so that really is what this role is about, is um, assisting data science and other analytics roles in preparing and transforming data and managing what we call the data life cycle. And Joe, I'll let you jump in for a minute. Yeah, I think that's a pretty uh, thorough explanation. I mean, at the end of the day, a data engineer takes raw data ingredients and processes them and makes them useful for data scientists and data analysts. I think if we were to encapsulate data engineering into one sentence, it's how we would define it. So, And as far as what data engineers do today, um, the role has changed a lot even in the last five years. So five years ago, you would read these articles talking about how the highest paid engineering profession in the future was going to be big data engineer. Um, and at the time, big data engineer meant managing Hadoop stacks, um, writing a lot of Spark code. And frankly, those things are still very much a part of the profession of data engineering, but um, cloud, cloud data warehousing and all kinds of cloud data processing tools have just grown dramatically in the last five years. Uh, companies that weren't even thinking about cloud five years ago are now planning their cloud migration strategies. And so that means that the modern data engineer, in addition to having to think about things like big data, really needs to think about how to manage and orchestrate a lot of different components and glue them together in order to manage this life cycle and build pipelines. And so before the show started, man, we were talking about how you guys use Apache Airflow, one of our favorite tools, because Airflow is not really a data processor per se. It can do some data processing, but it's mostly about controlling all this complexity that you now need to process data in the modern data stack. Thank you so much, because I feel as a student, when you graduate out of college, it's never talked about these professions or job roles. It's mostly about being a data scientist or being a data analyst. But nowadays I see this data science consultancy, this engineering and a lot of roles emerging up in this field of data science. Yeah, and I would say it's it's um, a quickly morphing, data engineering is a quickly morphing field. I would say the same thing's happening with data science right now though too. Uh, the data science, the data science being done in 2016 is not the data science being done today, and I would say you know a lot of that is there's beginning to be a lot of overlap between, um, you know what, whatever data engineering is today, as well as you know ML engineering. You know, so if you think about it, like you know there's sort of uh, data engineering maybe on the input side, and there's data science that sits in the middle. Right, and that could also include data analytics. But then there's also the, now this new sub, I would say other field on the other side of data science where now you're having to productionize machine learning. And so, uh, you know, I, I think our prediction is too that, uh, and then you have software engineering. This is this is one I think that goes unspoken about a lot, but all these disciplines I, I expect are going to be melding into some very um, interesting and perhaps unexpected ways over the next uh, five, 10 years. So right, the, the data science and data engineering you see today is not, the, uh, the data science and data engineering you're going to see, you know, a decade from now. 
Yeah, technology is changing at such a breakneck pace. I mean, a decade from now, I think we're going to see a much larger cloud footprint than we have right now. What's the statistic, Joe? I mean, in terms of, it, it depends on whose estimate you believe, but it's something like maybe 4% of, of spending that's going to be in the cloud is it's, already It's, cloud it's anywhere like from like 5 to 25% or maybe yeah. 30, depending. And then other estimates say it's like 50, but I tend to err on the, the uh, middle of that uh, just because... Uh, it be, our experience bears this out. I think a lot of companies uh, talk about going to the cloud, but you know, it's still, it's still super early days, right? And so, yeah, technologies will change, uh, practices will change. Um, like data, when you look at where data is compared to software engineering, for example, it's at least 10 years behind software engineering best practices right now. And so there's still a lot of room to grow. But of course, knowing that having knowledge of software engineering best practices also accelerates that window. So it's not like a fixed 10 year window that you're behind, you know, the gap will um, shrink, but that also assumes that software engineering best practices also stay stagnant, which they won't. So, right. And data technologies are changing so rapidly. I mean, how many new data technologies yeah. are we going to see uh, both open source and proprietary in the cloud over the next 10 years? Um, <laughs> I would predict quite a few. I mean, what someone called it like a Cambrian explosion of technologies that we now have to confront. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and now I think it, the stage is yours and you can go ahead with talking about all the myths of data engineering. And we have some question from the audiences beforehand, so we'll take it later on after the yours session. Okay, do you want me to uh, talk about some myths? Yeah, okay. let me uh, share some slides real quick then. So yeah, the, the topic of, of you know, this discussion is uh, data engineering myths, right? And so I think it makes sense. Uh, before I talked about who we are, uh, we're recovering data scientists, math nerds. Um, we talked about what a data engineer is, right? So a data engineer takes raw data ingredients and uh, makes them useful for downstream uh, users such as data scientists and analysts. So, I mean, what the heck are we talking about here? Data engineering is a very hot field. Still, uh, there are some myths around data engineering. Our goal is to discuss, maybe dispel, maybe bust some myths. So let's get to it. So, I mean, there, I think there's kind of a, this false paradox right now where uh, in one camp, People feel that data science is better than data engineering, or maybe data engineering is better than data science. Um, I don't know, Matt, what, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I mean, I think both of the roles are really critical. We're, we're starting to hear some ratios about numbers of data scientists versus data engineers that you need. One, I've, I've heard like maybe two data engineers to three data engineers per data scientist sometimes, depending on the organization. What do you think about that? That I think fundamentally, I don't think one role or the other is better or more enjoyable. Um, both are really critical, but I think we're seeing a bigger shortage on the data engineering side right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it goes back to the, uh, the you know the, the cliched stat that data scientists spend eighty percent of their time you know cleaning and processing data. I mean, that really should be the job of a data uh, engineer at the end of the day. And so, um, I would say that that. You know, if anything, that should be an equal sign between the two. Uh, you know, but I do, I do hear data scientists saying, "Well, you know, data engineers are, are lesser than me," and and vice versa. You're starting to hear data uh, engineers, um, you know, kind of condescendingly talk about data scientists. Um, I would say uh, both disciplines need each other, uh, just for the sheer virtue of that's how the data lifecycle works. So. Uh, you know, when when things are working well, a data engineer is going to provide the data scientists the, uh, you know, the, the raw data ingredients that they need in order for the data scientists to effectively do their job, right? And then the feedback loop is data scientists, um, you know, provide feedback on, you know, data meaning, data quality, um, data availability to the data engineer. So, you know, the, that data engineer can make the data scientist's life better. You know, yeah, as well as providing the feedback loop between machine learning and, and data engineering, like taking the, uh, uh, you know, the output of data science and bringing it back to, um, you know, the data engineering pipelines. 
So what are you saying, Matt? Oh, so Kushal has a question <laughs> in the chat about whether data engineers, uh, data engineers need some ML skills. And I think the growing industry consensus is that they do. And that doesn't mean that they need to be ML experts, but they need to be conversant in machine learning. And one place where this has shown up, for example, is on the Google Cloud Platform Professional Data Engineer exam. I just took it recently. And it used to be that it was just about data engineering. And now they do have a lot of machine learning questions on there because they want you to be able to talk to your data scientists and machine learning engineers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I, I think, it, yeah, industry's pushing it in the form of certifications. And it's also just, I think, a practical notion, right? Like if you're, at the end of the day, like one of your jobs, um, just as somebody who's employed at any job is to know your customer. And for a, a data engineer, a data scientist is your customer, right? So you need to know the customer's needs. You need to be able to empathize with the customer. And part of that is knowing best practices around uh, you know, how does data analytics work, right? If I'm providing a data scientist um, or an analyst um, data, is this data going to be useful maybe in, say, a chart or a report? Likewise, is this data going to be useful in building machine learning models? And, and if so, what kind of machine learning models? Because part of the data engineer's role is to make sure that the data um, has continuity of meaning you know, and, and maintains business definitions that are used downstream. And so, yeah, I, I would say very um, overwhelmingly, a data engineer needs to have an under, at least a basic understanding of machine learning and I would say analytics as well. If you yeah. don't, that, I think that works against you. And I, I, would, I personally wouldn't hire a data engineer who doesn't at least have a grasp of the basics of uh, ML or analytics. Yeah, and it's, it's just the general problem of siloing Everyone is less efficient if they just kind of stay in their little silo. Um, mm -hmm. These teams are meant to work together. They really need to communicate. Yep. You done with uh, myth one? Anything more on that one? I think, I think that's it for now. Yeah, cool. Drop any questions uh, in the chat. Yeah, myth two. Data engineering is a big data tool. And I would say, you know, the notion is data engineering equals a tool, period, right? So data engineering is not, a tool does not represent data engineering. Spark is not data engineering. I, I actually had a LinkedIn post where I think, I think it simply said, uh, data engineering is not equal to Spark. And that got a lot of, um, a lot of accolades, uh, some pushback, but um, they're wrong. Um, data engineering is not a tool. Yeah, and this question about big data, I mean, look at the number of cloud tools now that are turnkey and will process big data. So you've got like Amazon Athena, you've got various Presto distributions, you have BigQuery, Snowflake are all big data tools. And so this means that the big data is no longer kind of the separate discipline of managing Hadoop or Spark. It, it's just part of the job wherever you go. And you don't necessarily need separate tools to do it anymore like you used to five to 10 years ago. And I would also say that, that data engineering was never about big data. I wish the term big data never existed actually. Personally, because yeah. it's, it's a distracting um, misnomer. If you think about it, what, what exactly is big data, right? So, so when, when big data, the term ar arose on the scene, I, I remember many discussions about, oh, well, it must mean data size. And so you, people would get into this, this contest of, well, you know, I, I'm, I have like 50 gigs of data. Well, that's nothing. I have like, you know, tens of terabytes of data. Then, of course, the person with the petabytes of data would, you know, um, you know, make everyone else feel you know insecure and inferior uh, as human beings, and um, it was never a question of data size, right? And so then he had the three V's of big data, of, you know, velocity, uh, variety, and volume. And again, I think that's a bit of a misnomer as well. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about data, and whether or not you're dealing with tools that are small, you know, that, that fit small amounts of data or small velocities or varieties or large amounts, I think it's, it misses the point. Um, big data arose, I think, more as because data was becoming sort of this um, uh, almost a circus sideshow in some way, where it's like, oh, look at the fantastically large data set. Um, and it missed the point that I, I think people were trying to just get more value out of the data because tools existed, whether or not you had, you know, a couple gigs of data or, you know, uh, five exabytes of data, right? 
So yeah, it was more, I, I it was more say, of a utility uh, discussion. Sorry, but say Matt. Oh yeah, completely agree. And I, I would also say, I mean, this was kind of a discussion around, you know, early 2000s when Google was struggling to analyze the entire web at the time. That was really hard for them. And Yahoo was struggling to process all the log files they had developing Hadoop. And now it's just not, we shouldn't, at this point in 2021, we shouldn't be hung up on technology. It's it's about the data, like you said, Joe. Yeah, and it's about utility, right? I mean, you know, the other day I was talking to a, you know, a guy who actually helped write Hadoop and wrote Hive. Uh, and it wasn't, and when, when he was going through the, those exercises, it wasn't like, he was saying, oh, well, I, I have to use a big data tool. He was simply trying to solve a problem for, for the company, in, in this case, Yahoo or Facebook, right? And they they had so much data coming in, they had to figure out how to how to um, use distributed computing to, to analyze this data and process it. And it was nothing about, well, now I need to use big data and I need to use a tool. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I saw people in the early 2010s firing up Hadoop and, and later Spark when they had like a, a couple gigs of data. It was more of the novelty of it. Like, and then they're saying, oh, we're, we're big data engineers, right? Um, and it's kind of total hogwash. Um, and, and to Matt's point, it's like there's so many tools out there. Uh, data engineering is a discipline. Again, step back to how we define it at least, right? Where you're just getting raw, raw data ingredients and you're making them useful for downstream users, your data scientists, your data analysts. So data engineering is certainly not a, a big data tool, let alone any tool. Yeah, we, and I would say, Oh, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, no I interrupt you. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, I would say that if you're spending all of your time installing different versions of Spark and hacking on Spark code, then you're probably not, unless that's your job, unless you work at Facebook and your job is just to work on Spark, then you're probably not doing a very good job as a data engineer. Like your, your job is to deliver data, basically. It's, it's not to necessarily hack on the latest thing that comes out. But then there's there's always the notion of resume driven development, yeah. right? And so I think there's a temptation to pick a tool because it's going to look good on your resume, so you can get the the cool job, um, you know, and look and look awesome in front of your friends. So um, cool. I think we busted this one. Yeah. Uh, myth three it sort of ties along with the uh, last point, but um, you know, if a fame company is doing something, I, I should do it too at my company, right? So uh, if if um, uh, you know, if pick a tool, any tool, right? If, if uh, Google's using, uh, you know, this, um, a mono repo, for example, obviously I should be using one in my company among, you know, pick, pick a company, pick that technology X. And I think the point behind this is um, you should figure out what your company does well from a core competency standpoint, and then uh, figure out the best way to innovate in that area. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, the reality is that the thing companies are big enough to have their own clouds, right? So last I heard, this may have changed. I haven't kept on, up on this conversation, but last I heard, Facebook ran a huge Hadoop <clears throat> cluster and ran a lot of Spark and Presto on top of that. Should you do that? Well, probably not because you're way smaller than Facebook and managing your own infrastructure may not make sense for your team. It may make a lot more sense for you to use an off-the-shelf turnkey solution on a cloud instead. Mm -hmm. But we've also heard rumors, I think, of uh, you know companies like Facebook and Twitter moving to uh, off-the-shelf uh, cloud-based tools, too. I'm not going to name names of uh, these products, but uh, you know, if, if that's the migration, um, you know, if it's good enough for them, then I suppose you should also think about uh, your, your architecture choices. So you know, the point being, if, they're, if, if these companies are, uh, you know, now considering spinning up, you know, uh, pedestrian <laughs> cloud technologies. Um, I think that might be an argument for for not taking the more difficult path of, of spinning up these very esoteric systems that were really made, tailor made for you know a fan company's uh, needs, right? Like your company's probably not uh, Facebook or Amazon, and so you should you shouldn't pretend that. Um, what we see a lot is we see a lot of cargo cult data engineering where because they see a company they may idolize doing something, therefore, um, this should be uh, something that, um, you know, their company does as well. Anything yeah. more to talk about on this one? 
I'll just say, I mean, every company has to decide what its specialty is. And a lot of the tech companies, their specialty really is data and developing custom data tools to solve very specific problems. But most companies have other specialties that they need to focus on instead. And it becomes a waste of resources to go out building custom stuff when off-the-shelf tools will do an extremely good job. Yep. I'll take this one, Matt. Yeah, so uh, I think partially, so, so this one is almost the flip side of the other question that we, or the other myth that we just talked about. Um, the reality is that by virtue of the changing nature of data engineering, if you are doing data science and machine learning, then at some point you should think about this division of labor into data engineering and other specializations. Um, we actually did a show last week about uh, full stack data. And sometimes in a small company, there is a need for full stack data. In other words, where the same people are the data scientists and the data engineers. But for the most part, once your company gets to any size and your data team you know, gets larger than say two, you need to think about some specialization into data engineering just because it dramatically improves the efficiency at which you can deliver value from your data. Yeah, what are your thoughts though? I mean, if you were to hire, make one hire uh, to start out at, you know, at a new company, would you get a data engineer, a dedicated data scientist, or maybe somebody who is a bit more full stack? Yeah, I mean, partially it would depend on what I was trying to do with that data. So for example, if I really just needed some analytics, then maybe an analyst who had some data engineering chops as well. If I needed to build very simple models quickly, then maybe a data scientist who knew a little bit about data engineering on top of it. So really, yeah, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. It, it, making that first hire is always very tricky because you're extremely mm -hmm. resource limited. Yep. But at the same time, I would say it's easier now because there are a lot of, uh, like, like we mentioned before, there's been a Cambrian explosion of tools um, that do remove the friction. I, I would say it, it's much easier to get, um, you know, a modern data stack, so to speak, stood up now than it was even a couple of years ago. And that's only going to con continue becoming easier. And so, you know, uh, even for smaller companies, uh, data engineering is something that you can do. And I would say even for you know some of our smaller clients uh, that have a handful of people um, in total as staff, you know, they're doing some pretty impressive things from a data perspective because there's just been a, a nice democratization of um, you know the tools available and the techniques available to solve what used to be very complicated problems reserved for big companies. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to emphasize too that this applies both on the database data engineering side and on the machine learning data science side. I mean, in many cases, if you are a small company with initially uh, looking for a quick win, then you want to use something like AutoML from Google or various other tools that are turnkey and not dig too deep into trying to customize those models. Just try to see what you can get without spending 100 hours working on a model. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and especially now, there's, there, I think there's very po uh, interesting point solutions made to solve, um, say you're in retail, for example, right? I mean, recommendation engines, you, you can just go get one of those off the shelf now. Now, of course, you know, you, you might want to start with that. I'm not saying you should end with that. That's the only thing you should do. Uh, if you have a very, um, if, if you, know, you have a very unique way of personalizing your site, you should definitely build around that. But you know, I would start with the basics and uh, and only then, once you've exhausted the potential of those, uh, build on top of those for something custom. But again, like nowadays, you have, I would say, at a very inexpensive price, the ability to do um, things with your company that were only reserved for large companies, you know, just even a few years ago. It's just kind of cool. So, yeah. Myth five. Yeah, this one before now. we move ahead, I have yeah. this one question that, um, can you go to myth four? So as you were explaining that if you need a data analyst, he would know more, also should know about data engineering. And so is it like a person should learn everything, uh, know about everything and he can apply for any role or they should like just focus on one thing when they're as students? going up in the field and applying for jobs? So I would say you really don't want to focus on learning every <clears throat> possible technology. I think that's a mistake. 
I think you want to focus on learning some foundations that will apply across disciplines. And uh, Joe and I have talked about the fact that both data scientists and data engineers would do well to learn, just get better at core things like SQL and Python, really get those foundations down. Um, then learn a lot about the ecosystem. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you become a master of Spark, but you should know how Spark is used by various companies and what it's good for. Maybe spin up some Spark demos, but I don't necessarily think that at the early stages you want to just specialize in the Spark and, and go in 100%. But you want to be, you want to show companies that you have a good foundation, that you know the disciplines, that you know a lot about what data scientists do, what the tool set is, how to choose tools. And then honestly, you're probably going to need to learn a lot on the job about a particular tech stack that that company is using. Yeah, I would, I would step back to and say, you know, the, the, even before you start learning tools, um, learn the fundamentals of things like the data lifecycle, for example, right? Um, like this is something we're going to hit on in, in the book we're writing right now, which is um, the, the tools will come and go, but the data lifecycle isn't going to change as much, right? And so that when you're studying, step back and understand the different paradigms of storage, for example, right? Um, you know, am I better off using uh, object storage or, um, you know, HDFS? Uh, what are what are different types of storage? What are different types of uh, file formats? Um, when, when I'm processing data, what are some of the bigger picture ideas of processing data? Do I do I do ELT or ETL? Right, and I think that'll give you a good framework too for evaluating what tool to pick. Um, the common mistake I see a lot of people do is they just jump right into learning Spark. That's probably the dumbest thing you could do for a lot of reasons. Yeah. You, you, you I know, guess you, many wouldn't know also what ETL and what's... Uh, yeah, ETL, ELT. sure, we can talk about that. So e ETL is extract, transform, load. So you're gonna extract data, you're gonna transform it, and then you're gonna load it into a, uh, a destination that could be a data lake or a data warehouse. Um, ELT sort of flips this on its head. So you're gonna extract data from a source system you're gonna load it into a destination and then you might do some transformations within that destination system. Uh, this really arose during the time of, um, uh, you know, sort of when cloud data warehouses uh, started becoming um, in vogue. This first started with Redshift. And I would say you know, an early adopter of this was a company called Fivetran. I, I recall actually one time I got an email from the founders of Fivetran and they're out there, you know, I think there were a two person startup at the time uh, hustling and selling these data connectors, right? So it's like, well, would you like to just load your data into, um, uh, Fivetran, you know, uh, into Redshift, um, you know, using Fivetran to load data into Redshift. And at the time I was like, well, that's not ETL. Um, the more I started thinking about it, I was like, these guys are onto something because, you know, leverage the, uh, the internal power of the data warehouse. You know, there's no sense of having these, um, ETL tools anymore. Like your Informatica is your talents. Um, when, you can just stage your data in your data warehouse because uh, compute and storage are very cheap these days, and just do your transformations in the uh, you know in, in place in the data warehouse. That was a very big, uh, I think, shift that that sort of started enabling a lot of the modern tooling that you're seeing. Whether we're talking about DBT or Matillion or you know Fivetran or any of the other, like hundreds of other tools that are out there right now. So hopefully that in a roundabout way explains uh, ETL and uh, ELT, um, you know, back to the question of learning, right? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of these big picture concepts. I would say learn these concepts and figure out what tools exist within each of these concepts at the data lifecycle, ingestion, storage, processing, and transformation, then obviously doing something with it, whether it's analytics or machine learning. So, but don't just pick a tool out of the gate. I think that that's, uh, it's an interesting way to pigeonhole yourself, especially as tools keep changing. Yeah, thanks. That answers my question. Cool. Um, five. Okay, <laughs> so we, we get this a lot. I'm, I'm trained as a data scientist. Data engineering is not for me. You want to hit it on this one, Matt? Yeah, so, so as I said earlier, the, the modern profession of data engineering at least partially evolved out of data science and this need to do all this pre-processing on data before you can actually train models. 
The reality is that if you're getting a really sound, solid grounding in data science, then you're starting to learn a lot of core skills for data engineering as well. So for example, you've probably learned a lot about Python. Well, Python shows up all over in the discipline of data engineering. You're learning a lot about just basic statistical processing of data, um, basic featureization. Again, that's very much a part of the data engineer's job. Um, hopefully you've interacted with databases a lot. Hopefully you've used a lot of SQL in the process of learning data science. Again, SQL is, it's still a core tool and it's becoming very important because of the emergence of these powerful cloud data warehouses and other frameworks like Presto that can process data with SQL. Will you need to expand your skill set? Yes, you definitely will. But you actually have the fundamentals to start a career in data engineering if that's the direction that you want to go in. Mm -hmm. And I would say that there's, there's you know, it, some advice you read on, on the internet too. It's like, oh, data scientists can't be data engineers. Yeah. Right. Um, I think Matt and I are both like proof by contradiction. Um, like, we started out more of a data science, science background and um, and we're doing data engineering and we formed a whole company around this. And we've seen this happen with, with a lot of other data scientists. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would think that, you know, especially if you could learn to, to be kind of ambidextrous, maybe be a, you know, a good data scientist and a good data engineer, it's a bit of a, I would say a tough request, but you know, if you were able to straddle both fields, I mean, you, you've, you've got, um, I guess at that point, you're sort of like a machine learning engineer, actually. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you're well skilled and I think you're going to be very, very valuable in the marketplace and, and don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it because uh, you can do it, can be done. Yeah. And, and the nature of demand right now is such that it, it seems like it's easier to get into data engineering and learn that discipline first before getting into data science, uh, just because they're frankly not enough data engineers are being trained and there's lots and lots of demand to support the data scientists that companies have hired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say too, it's interesting because I think the role of a, uh, a data scientist is actually gonna be changing. Like we talked about earlier, the, the role of a data scientist over the next few years is gonna start morphing more into a, a, an engineering discipline in and of itself. For the simple fact that the, if you look back at where data science was, maybe 2015, 2016, 2017, it was all about training models. Um, that's becoming more of a solved problem for the most part, either in, in the sense where you have frameworks that can uh, you know, help you create awesome models, like fantastic models, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, you know, SKLearn, XGBoost, and the list goes on and on. Um, as well as hardware to, to train these models in, in you know, very great fashion. And then there's also AutoML, right? And, and pre-trained models that you can use. So the, 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 I think the notion that you need to get really good at model training, um, I just don't think it's gonna be as important going forward. I think that that's, um, of course, there's still gonna be the need for AI researchers, but that's a much separate task than what most uh, data scientists um, will ever do on a job. You're not going to be tr like creating GPT-3 or GPT-10 or whatever you know, the iterations are. That's not the job for most data scientists. Most data scientists are connected to business to provide, um, you know, to, to use data to provide business value. And that's, that's it. And so I think that the role is going to actually switch more into bifurcating between, uh, you know, providing maybe machine learning powered business intelligence, as well as morphing into more of an engineering role to, pr to productionize uh, pipelines. So data scientists, I think it's gonna be more of a data engineering and or a machine learning engineer role with, with the emphasis on providing business value, obviously. Yeah, so. yeah, I think that totally makes sense. I mean, GPT, for example, right, G GPT-3, I think it doesn't Microsoft sell it as a service now? I think they I started think to pay, yeah. yeah, to use it and even do some custom training and such. And maybe mm -hmm. that's the point. I mean, that likely is the future of data science and ML engineering at many organizations. If they're not specialized in machine learning engineering, then they're going to be using a lot more off the shelf tools and just managing them appropriately. And the skill set will be about choosing the tools, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. The one area I find interesting is, uh, you know, edge computing and, uh, 
um, you know, deploying models at, at, at the edge, like for IoT or for um, vehicles and stuff. I think that's still a, that's, that's more of a moving target. Um, but for business facing stuff where you're just uh, making churn models, I mean, that's, that's a solved problem at this point. So now, of yeah. course, it's a matter of deploying it. That's a much different question. But like the ability to solve these problems is already here. The, the appetite to, to do this in a business, I would say, is there's still a level of immaturity that uh, uh, still is going to take some time to sort out. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, deploying and uh, domain expertise in your own data, which is something that data engineers and data scientists need to gain on the job, like really getting into the data and talking to the people who understand it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I think that's the last myth we want to talk about, but we're happy to uh, talk about questions. I'll actually stop sharing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And Manpreet, do you want to, it sounds like there was a form and then we have some questions in the chat as well. So where do we want to start on questions? Yeah, there are a few, I guess, a lot of questions. So the first oh, one we have is from Kushal that when engineering data, what sort of tools are used? Like I listen about some AutoML feature tools, feature stone, et cetera. Are they extensively in feature engineering or it's hand engineering? Mm, I would say feature engineering is still one of these last mile problems uh, for structured data, especially. Um, it is increasingly becoming easier if you're an AWS, for example, uh, they have Data Wrangler and uh, I think some other tools that allow you to at least um, hand create features. It, it's, I still haven't seen, it's getting better. There, there's definitely some tools out there that I think do automated pre-processing of, of, now we're talking about tabular data, of course, right? So rows and columns. Um, I would say with images or NLP, this is actually a lot easier to solve because there's um, tokenization techniques and embedding techniques uh, for NLP. That's just, it's fairly easy with images and video. Uh, that's a, you're simply dealing with like uh, 3D dimension. Yeah, you're just unwinding pixels at the end of the day, right? And uh, with structured data though, it's actually much harder. This is actually one of the hard problems in machine learning still is how do you, um, how do you create a data set that, uh, first, how, how do you feature engineer? This is still a classically tough problem because you're dealing with human generated data that is, um, where the features are uh, kind of whatever was input into the uh, um, uh, rows and columns, right? But there's no maybe no rhyme or reason for it. So you have different scaling techniques you can use to you know, scale your features and different ways that you can remove uh, and you know and maybe combine features. But that's it's still tricky. Um, you know, deep learning is supposed to help with this. I, I'm still skeptical, um, you know, of that and. Obviously, you know, the, the issue becomes when you're trying to, to use, um, you know, these machine learning uh, model training techniques on structured data, uh, it, much of it depends upon the, uh, whether or not your data is linear or, or nonlinear, right? So, um, you know, and your ability to, for an algorithm to make sense of that is still, I'd say uh, it's, it's getting better, but, you know, the feature engineering is still hard. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll comment on um, BQML. So this is BigQuery ML. It's one of Google's products. You can just have your data in BigQuery and you can train several different model types on top of it. And that product has evolved to where they do offer several types of featureization automatically. So for example, you can have a categorical col column with a couple of different values and they'll take care of the one hot encoding for you so that this will work appropriately but not everything is taken care of. And so you kind of, it's just, you have to dig into the documentation you have to understand, okay, how can I featureize for this type of model? Where will Google's featureization work for me? Where does it not work? And th there are lots of stack overflow posts and discussions about this. And yeah, like, like Joe was saying, it's not a hundred percent solved problem. You may want to bring up um, the, the feature store meetup coming up actually. I think uh, anyone interested in this question would really enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think somebody asked about feature stores in the uh, chat here. Um, yeah, given a, having a talk, I run the uh, Utah Data Engineering Meetup. And the next topic on, what would that be? So that'd be April 21st in the US at night. So that would be April 22nd in the morning in India. But uh, we have uh, Willem Pinier from uh, Tekton. He's also the uh, creator of Feast, which is a uh, 
um, open source library for feature stores. Uh, so if you're interested in learning about, um, you know, feature stores, which you know, admittedly I think is a, is a very popular buzzword, um, come check it out. Uh, I think you're going to learn a lot. I know I'm looking forward to it. So and basically, feature stores are a way of, well, there's there's not really actually a consensus yet on it, but it's a way of making features useful uh, repeatedly for machine learning. Uh, so you don't run the risk of having to uh, recreate features unnecessarily and uh, perhaps um, skew your models unnecessarily. So. Please um, share the link so that we can share it with them as well if you have yeah. any. And the next question we have is, um, I wanted to know about cloud resources to train ML and DL models for personal projects, which one should I give preference if free resource is my preference? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of really nice tools now. You always have to watch <laughs> your spending. Uh, BQML is a really nice place to start, BigQuery Machine Learning. Um, but just dig into the documentation for the type of model you're trying to train and how much free tier credit you have and try it out. But, you know, make sure you're not going over what you anticipate spending. Yeah, what are your comments on this, Joe? Um, sorry, I was, I was actually had the link to the meetup here. <laughs> I had the same problem. Yeah, I could, we can't get in the chat apparently. So. Um, sorry, what was the, what was the uh, question? Just re rephrase it real quick. Oh, the question is if, if someone wants to use like an automated tool in the cloud to experiment with training models um, and they want to keep it free, what, what do you recommend? So I mentioned BQML, just read the documentation to see the mm. one that's... I mean, there's, there's, I would say, as long as you can stay within the free tier, I think Google Cloud yeah. actually has a very generous free tier and you could use AI platform. Um, I would think actually uh, Colab is the one I usually go to for a lot of stuff. Colab so if you, have a, if you have a, if you have a uh, Google, um, like a Gmail account, so you can get um, free Jupyter Notebooks um, in the cloud uh, with, a G with a GPU. And I think you can get a TPU with that too. And so if you, if you wanted to uh, you know, get, get a bit more oomph, you could uh, pay, what is it, 10 bucks a month US for a paid Colab account, and it's awesome. So I would just say, you know, maybe start with that. So. And then maybe Databricks Community Edition. I haven't followed the evolution too much to know if it supports deep learning at this point, but you know, it's certainly worth exposing yourself to some of that technology at a free tier level. Yeah, there's a lot of companies right now, I would say it's uh, uh, sort of this weird renaissance where there's, there's no end of uh, great companies with great tools and free tiers. So it, it's hard to even know where to start, honestly. Yeah. But. Yeah, and the next question is by Kunal. Um, could you guys explain more about data analytics and how a non-tech person can enter in data analytics domain? What skill sets needed? Command and present data to kick off career. Um, that's a good question. A analytics uh, is an awesome career. I mean, it's, uh, and, and I think it's, you know, where to start, um, here's the deal. Like Excel is widely used. I would say get really good. If you're gonna be an analyst, uh, there's two things. There's obviously a tooling discussion and the best practices discussion. That's always how I, I look at things, right? So, uh, you know, being a non-tech person, you can still learn, I would say, having a good um, understanding of statistics and uh, statistical modeling is a very good step. Um, Understanding maybe a domain of an industry that you want to get into. Uh, it's another important step. So you could learn how to apply analytical and statistical techniques to solving problems within that industry. And then finally learning a tool, right? But, but if you don't have a statistical background and the analytical background, like uh, no amount of tools is going to help you. In fact, it might make it worse. <laughs> so, uh, it, cause you'll tend to just rely on the black box the tool is giving you, and, so, and which is fine once you know what you're doing, but you need to understand whether or not the results you're getting back or, um, you know, pass a sanity check, right? Um, so then that comes back to Excel. I, I think Excel is still, I think actually what you're gonna see is Excel is gonna become a lot more popular than it already is. And it's the most widely used data tool right now. I think that by some estimates it's 750 million Excel users in the world. 
Um, so if you want to talk about a tool that is very transferable, you know, across industries or across, you know, careers and jobs, Excel is by far the one I would choose if you're going to be an analyst. From there, obviously, there's other tool techniques you could you could learn. Maybe that's Tableau. Um, maybe SQL would be another one to to pick up. So you can interact with databases. But again, it really comes back to your know-how of applying analytical and statistical techniques to any type of tool. I think once you figure that out, learning the tool, learning languages is, is a lot simpler. So, and the other part of this too, that I think the thing that goes unsaid in data analytics is data analyst, the role of a data analyst is very much a full contact sport with other people in the business. You're not gonna be sitting behind your desk typically um, making Excel sheets and not communicating with, with business stakeholders. I would say 80% of your job is talking with stakeholders in the business, understanding their needs, understanding the problems they're trying to solve, and then helping them solve those problems. If you're not doing that as an analyst, um, you should be fired. So, or your, or your employer sucks, one of the two. Um, but your job literally is to help solve business problems. And so you have to get out there and talk to people. And so you have to be comfortable talking to people. And I think having there's sometimes difficult discussions with people, asking hard questions, being able to dig into tr the underlying truth behind stuff and not just taking things at face value. These to me are, you know, statistical techniques, analytical techniques coupled with good communication and, and uh, negotiation and, and diplomacy skills, I think, are by far the more important skills to have as an analyst versus I need to know R or Python or Tableau. Those come after. You've got the, the the basic skill set down, the basic foundation. I have seen more analysts fail because they want to hide, and I use the word hide. I think very strongly. You're hiding behind tools. You're hiding behind techniques, and you're not solving business problems. That's a cardinal sin in analytics. And like I say I, I'm very strongly opinionated on this. I think if an analyst isn't going out there and talking to the business and providing value, they shouldn't have a job. On that sure note, what do you have to say, Matt? Um, I, yeah, so I, I would say in terms of job skills, you're not going to go wrong by learning SQL. I think Excel, like Joe said, Excel is good too, just because the really great thing about Excel is that it lets you understand basically how data works before you get into bigger databases where it's much less transparent. You need, it's a good foundation. And also it's a good way to build analytics on data that you've pulled out of the database. But yeah, then, then get really solid on SQL put that on your resume, demonstrate your SQL skills. There, that's an entree into all kinds of different jobs. And the great thing today, it, it used to be really hard to set up a SQL database. Um, and so there was this big barrier to entry to really learning the skills. And now you have all these turnkey solutions in the cloud where you can very cheaply turn these on and experiment with data. I mean, honestly, for just learning SQL, BigQuery is probably your best option because it's very, very cheap to run. You, you just go, if you have a Gmail account, you basically have a BigQuery account. You can sign in and set it up and they provide you with data that you can query immediately. Just watch your costs, like try not to spend a ton of money and, and blow through all your free tier credit. But yeah, you can jump into BigQuery and go through SQL tutorials and really develop the skill and then shop that around for potential jobs. Mm -hmm. And I Sorry, your audio cut out. Sorry, I think, it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's uh, important to know your data and your business problem uh, when you are a data scientist or data engineer or a data analyst, mm -hmm. anything. Uh, the primary thing is to understand the business purpose it would serve and the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. and the next question we have for the day is how can one get prepare himself at the level of company standard as learner doesn't have resources and time to invest or make state of art models as a project to showcase? Mm. I would say make more than having, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, I would say I would say like find the time. I mean, if it's that important yeah. to you, like, make the time, right? Um, and, then, and there's there's no end of resources out there either. I, I would say there's almost there's almost it's almost the opposite problem. There's too many resources, so it's kind of hard to know where to start. It's like you have this paradox yeah. of choice, right? I mean, because there's it's, especially in uh, data science, there's no shortage of how to become a data scientist. Like it seems like you could you could walk ten feet and like trip over about like twelve tutorials, you know, with each step on how to become a data scientist. 
Now the time to invest and optimize, that's up to you. Uh, I, I think the question comes down to how seriously do you want to, like how badly do you want to do this? Um, and that, I think that's going to dictate how much time you want to invest. So. I think that's also because your way of learning and approach would be so different to a person who is asking this because some mm -hmm. might learn through courses, some might learn by doing projects and building themselves. So yeah, there's yeah, it's not like a right answer to this. There's not a single answer. I would say there's a lot of yeah. right answers and I, I would say there's not a lot of wrong answers either. It's just like how much time do you want to spend on it? And so the, the time yeah. question really comes down to how efficient do you want to be? Right. I think that's maybe the more important yeah. question, because especially if you're time constrained, look, everyone's time constrained. Uh, like Matt and I talk about this. We've actually tried to remo remove the word busy from our vocabulary because like, what do you choose to prioritize? If you're going to prioritize yeah. getting these skills and, you know, come hell or high water, like that's going to be what you're going to do. If, you, if you're trying to prioritize this while you're like, you know, um, you know, playing Fortnite and like, you know, <laughs> that you got like 12 other hobbies, I, I doubt you're going to like invest the time you need to, to, to make this happen. So it really, it's an individual question. You know, my coach always asks me and my athletic coach, he's always like, so what, what is, what are you, do, what are you going to do to, what are you going to give up to make this happen? Right. And like, why is this important to you? I think those are the kinds of questions you got to ask. And then obviously then you got to figure out a learning path. I think to your point, man, pretty about what, what's going to work for you. Cause there's, there's a lot of ways you could do this. And I guess it's not always a beginner who has to learn, but as professionals learn every day, as you said, within a decade, things would change, new tools would come. So I think you also learn every day and a person who's experience yeah. is still learning because um, the competition is just not with you, but the new people out are more smarter than we into the profession because they they're building so good projects and doing stuff. So I think it's learning is a continuous process for everyone. Oh, it is. And if you're going to have one skill, I don't think we touched on this, but the, the single best skill you could have as a professional in general, because everything's changing, but especially in the world of data and engineering, um, it's just learning how to learn and continuously learn and making that your top priority. Because if you can do that, and if you could just like outwork everybody around you, you're going to get ahead. Um, you know, and just continuously learning, like com it's, it's compound interest, like it just builds every day, but you're not going to notice it when you're in the middle of it. But when you look back on how much you've learned in the past year or five, um, and if you can keep that going, you're going to be unstoppable. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add that it's a balancing act. I mean, I think Joe and I both abhor resume driven development where people are making these technical decisions just to burnish their resumes and bringing in technology <laughs> that makes no sense. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> Do a really good job, like focus on what's going to help your company and not just bringing in random technologies, but also try to try to identify things that will be useful in the future and at least get a basic understanding of those technologies. And, you know, we, we are big advocates for certifications as well. I used to be very cynical about certifications and think that it was just a mark to put on your resume. But I think um, if you're working in the cloud in GCP or AWS, getting those certifications will actually teach you a lot of new legitimate skills that you just didn't have before. And the same goes if you're not in the career path yet. Um, if you want to be a data engineer and you don't know what to do next, learn SQL, learn Python, and then maybe start getting some certifications and that's gonna make you attractive to a potential employer. Yeah. And before we sign out, would you like to throw some lights on the book that you are writing that you just mentioned in the talk? Oh. Yeah. So we just uh, <laughs> signed with, um, uh, it's called the fundamentals of data engineering. So the, the notion of the book is to help um, actually, you know, data it, it's to provide a, a roadmap for uh, various people in the data field uh, to understand and maybe become data engineers, right? So this could be software engineers, data scientists, analysts who really want to get a grasp of like the fundamentals of data engineering. So the data engineering life cycle, um, sort of the elements that undercut every part of the life cycle as well as best practices within each part of the life cycle, ingestion, storage, processing, et cetera. Um, you know, this book is really meant to be a blueprint for um, you know, people who 
want to get a good grasp of data engineering as well as I think data engineers who just maybe don't have a good grasp of like the, the you know, the end to end landscape of it. So that's the goal. Um, it'll be coming out in fall of uh, 2022 unless we get it done earlier. Uh, so stay tuned on that. In the meantime, we'll probably be doing a lot of uh, online courses about this as well as, um, you know, uh, uh, putting out a lot of um, articles and content around this, this topic. It's something that's, I think, very near and dear to Matt and I, where we just noticed the um, level of discussions around data engineering was always centered on tools and stuff that completely missed the mark, I think, in terms of like, like what is data engineering? Just this in a book. And how do you so, choose tools even? You know, how do you make decisions yep. about technology? There are lots of really great Spark manuals, manuals on SQL, even various databases. But yeah, we, we kind of saw a gap in knowledge. And I think a lot of people have this knowledge that they've acquired with a lot of experience, but there just wasn't a book to talk about the whole process of modern data engineering. Mm -hmm. Yep. So stay tuned. It'll be out in a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining us on thank Friday you. mornings. And thank you so much for everyone over here listening to us. Well, yeah. um, looking forward to your books and sessions. Yeah, of course. And thanks to everybody who, who attended this uh, at night, too. I'm, I'm amazed. Yeah. It's, it's Friday night. Um, <laughs> we, uh, thanks a lot for the But support. it's lockdown so. night. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you guys are locked down. I guess you don't have anything else to do. You guys are um, stuck with us. Well. Sorry. <laughs> well, glad we, glad we could be your entertainment for the evening. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, awesome. cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. All right take care.